Welcome to Off Watch, our weekly interview series where this week our guest is Martine Grail. Now, I got the chance to ask you for any specific questions last week that you had for this Brazilian sailing star. Thank you very much for everybody that sent those questions in and helped me form the basis of this interview. Martine can sometimes be a little bit shy in front of the camera. However, she's always pretty honest. And she spoke to me very candidly about what it was like on board Team Axe and the Bell at the start of the last edition with all the drama that they were facing. Plus, she explained why she doesn't actually like talking about her gold medal winning performance at Rio 2016. If you enjoy this interview, like and subscribe for more. We've got plenty more interviews coming up in the next few weeks. But in the meantime, enjoy this one. My guest this week is Martin Grail, who won gold for Brazil in our home Olympics in Rio 2016. A year later, she competed in the ocean race in the 2017-18 edition, finishing fourth with Team Axanabel. And she was regularly seen on the helm, unusual for a first timer. At 29 years of age, her sailing successes speak for themselves. And she has regularly ranked at the very top of the 49er FX Olympic class since it debuted in 2013. Um, Martine, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, let me just start off by by recognizing the fact that, of course, you are that Martine Grail. You are part of the Grail family, and I'm I'm wondering, you before you were born, your father Torben Grail, one of the most famous sailors in the world, wins two Olympic medals. As you're growing up, you're part of a family that adds another three Olympic medals, two of them gold. And your father wins the ocean race with Ericsson four. Was it always inevitable that you were going to be as competitive as you are in the sport of sailing? No, um, I don't think so. I think the environment you grow up actually shapes you more than more than you know your blood. Yeah. And I think having an older brother and growing up with uh, a lot of boyfriends I always um I think I went to that competition mode but uh actually only later on uh in the beginning it was pretty much just fun my competition was in other things like uh, playing soccer or you know running around but uh, um as I got on with the opties and you know got on with other classes um I started really getting a uh, I go for the competition and and I got to a moment where uh, my father actually asked me if I if I wanted to keep going because I like to I, I like to travel around or <laughs> make friends or if I really like competition and for me that was a um, you know a, a very remarkable moment that I really like thought for myself that I really loved competition and and you did well at a pretty young age. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that we could talk about with your, with your optimists. And I mean, you, you had a good go in the 29er, things like that. But I guess, you know, I'm wondering 420, uh, 2009 with the, well, what was then the ISAF youth, uh, worlds, um, you do pretty well. You come away with a, with a first place. Um, at what point was, was that something special about going and representing your country, Brazil, on your back. I mean, you were young at that point. What You must have been maybe 18, 17, 18, and you're there representing your country. Does your first moment like that feel a little bit special? Um, actually, the whole 420 uh, um, time that I had with my uh, different crews, they all, um, they were all really good, you know, I, I really had so much motivation. I was studying and sailing was not the pri like the, I was not a professional, you know, but I was still sailing four days a week and, you know, getting buses to go across the Bay in Rio and sail and, and, and I did um, two uh, open worlds and two uh, youth worlds, one in the uh, 29 er and one in the 420. And that second one in 2009, we uh, we won, and it was definitely, you know, I don't know, the cherry on top of the cake of this whole 420 period. And I think the 
what really really is remarkable is like your training partners and who you sail with, you know, your crew. And it showed me how important it is, even more important than having the best boat or the best, you know, is having the best crew. Um, and then the best boat is just the detail, you know. But uh, teaming up with good people makes makes most of most of it. Okay, well, I want to get into that because obviously the ocean race, you're not just teaming up with one person. You're teaming up with an awful lot of people. That you know, there's the the other sailors, but there's a whole team in the background. But before I ask you about that, let's talk about uh, uh, your crew in the 49er FX. A successful partnership that's still going well now, a Kahina Kunz. So when did you guys come together? Because you knew each other for a long time. Yeah, we uh, we had separate, um, uh, you know, teams. And yeah. I had a, a crew and she had a skipper and we both, both of them couldn't do the Youth Worlds in 2009. And that was two years before. And we were like, oh yeah, we can, we can do it together if we qualify, you know, because we are the same age. And and then two years before we set it to do it, and and then we just did it. And it was. And then after that, I uh, asked both my crews if they wanted to keep on with the um, Olympic sailing, but they thought it was a, you know, a big step to take. Like it was, it, it's not a lot of funding in Brazil, and it's not like a right pathway to take. So it was a very uncertain path. So they both decided to keep on study. And I started sailing with Isabel in the 470 class, which is, which was my um, debut in uh, Olympic sailing. And she had come from a bronze medal at the Beijing Olympics. Mm. So for me, it was like, uh, what a invitation, you know, I couldn't refuse that one. But you guys... And then, uh, well, later on, we, we, we started, we went back sailing together, me and Kaena. And we're still, today, we're... We're planning training in two days' time. Yeah, so so you're you're talking to me now from Portugal. You're still competing in the 49er FX. And this is something that I find very interesting because just like any friendships, any relationships, any sailing partnerships, for people that have been together for so long, there must be moments where it feels really good and then there must be moments where it doesn't feel good. Um, for you guys, has it been strong and solid the whole way or have there been those little times where it's testing? No, it's a, any long-term relationship, I think even marriage, you know, you, you, you get to know the person so well that you know when they're frustrated. Sometimes you know what they're thinking, how the way they think and... Um, it's, it's sometimes is quite annoying, you know, when you get stressed with each other. And what happens a lot with Olympic sailing is that you're only together for the hard part where you're, you want to, uh, you know, push each other and you start spending most of your off time away. So you're only together for the bad part. While in the beginning, you're together for the bad part and the good part. You're doing like trips together. And I think that's a little bit what is grows different. But I think the respect is the same. And and paint us a bit of a picture about what it's like being on the 49er FX. For those people that haven't sailed the 49er FX, because um, when we say two sailors, I mean, you are shoulder to shoulder, wrapped in together. I mean, it's 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 quite a boat to sail. I was trying to make up with that one, trying to explain to someone what, what it was. It's kind of like being a, a ballerina in a circus and <laughs> doing synchronized synchronized swimming and I don't know maybe something with strength and something mixing in the mix you know there's a lot of coordinated movements and the 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 balance of the boat is quite critical for the for the steerage and I think um, if you have a lot of time together you can coordinate those movements and and you know, if you don't have a lot of time together, it makes it clear, like, the maneuvers. And then the tactics is um, pretty pretty open because you can tack a lot, not like catamarans. And, um, but you do have the boats go quite fast, so you do need to plan ahead quite a bit. And for me, I was uh, 
very nice coming from uh, 470 because it's more you know agile and and things happening the whole time while sometimes the 470 i felt like sitting down in slow motion a little bit but um yeah so it's i love action and i love you know challenges so i think that's a little bit what drove me to uh, to the ocean race yeah so you, i mean you had some familiar faces obviously and i'm wondering what it's like because at one minute you're racing against this peop- th- th- these people and you must have had times where Francesca Klapcic or Tamara Chagoya or someone comes in at a lured mark and you don't think that, you know, you, you think they broke the rule. You must have some moment where you were, shall we say, not very friendly. But when you're on the shore, is that all forgotten? Are you just friends again? Uh, I think that happens every day you know on the water and you're I'm very good friends at at least I think I'm very good friends with everybody I'm sure you know and uh on the water is totally different your competitors and it's like and not the enemy but you know it's you're not gonna spare anybody just because they're your friend you know it's in the water is competition and the rule applies and you know you you can but in the Olympic sailing it happens a lot like that you have some smaller um, instance that they can be uh, eased uh, by one or the other because you're you're facing each other so much, you know, you're crossing each other, and sometimes it's it's better for you to ease at somebody and then get eased later on. You know, the only thing, the only moment that that doesn't happen quite often is in the Olympics. Nobody wants to ease at anybody. You know, it's. Uh, it's a different moment, but other than that, in other competitions, I really don't like to go to the protest room. I think it's it's very nice to be able to, uh, you know, get some agreement and, I don't know, try to solve it out of the protest room. <laughs> okay, well, let's go then to the games. As you say, it's a bit of a different moment. I'm wondering for you, I mean, I, I don't even know, you know, it's it's your home Olympics. Was that the water that you used to sail on? I mean, how much like home did it feel? Totally, totally like home. Rio Olympics, it's the, the, it's like my backyard, you know, it's where we sail every day until today, you know, and um, it's, it's, it was just amazing to do that cycle because a lot of people were coming uh, to Rio to train. So we got a lot of sailing there with other sailors and uh, spent some time at home in a cycle. Um, and yeah, I think this, this, uh, was very special there, you know, having our friends there in the, in the Olympics to watch the race and to celebrate with us. It was just, it couldn't be any better. I really, uh, they're really good memories, but for me, you know, it's funny that I don't like to look back too much at the Olympics because that's like, it's past waters, you know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I really like to focus on on what's going on now and I feel like if I get too attached to the past it might disturb my present you know (laughs) okay hint taken we'll move on we'll move on so you finish Rio then the next thing that we see you in in a big way is uh the ocean race with T-Max and Abel there wasn't an awful lot of time between Rio in the summer of 2016, and then the start of the 2017, um, well, the Volvo Ocean races. It was then. When did you get to be part of Team Max and Abel? When did you get your first taste of sailing on a VO65? Um, actually, it was a bit before with Mafre. I was uh, I was invited from Chabi to sail with them, but I was very much in doubt because I, I um, didn't do, know anybody in the crew. And when Axel Noble teamed up, Jaka was assigned to be a uh, watch captain. And Jaka is a, is a good friend of my dad's and I know him from Rio and, and also Brad Jackson. So I thought that, you know, starting on something that I didn't know and and it could be a difference to have like um, somebody that I could, you know, go for and, you know, ask some honest questions and I don't know, not be afraid of judgment. And 
but uh, but as soon as I made that decision, I, I didn't get quite to try with Axnova because all the legs that we did to, to uh, training legs, there was no wind. <laughs> I don't know. It was just something from the destiny. You know, there was no wind. We did motoring the whole way. And yeah, it was a shame. But uh, and then later on, just before the race started, we had a big issue in our team that the um, the skipper got taken out of the team um, with a lawsuit, and it was quite shocking for us. We didn't quite we didn't understand everything that was happening and what each part had done wrong. We just wanted to uh, settle up and get going because we thought. The, project to still go on you know and it was very confusing when Simon got back um not confusing but it was just so late you know it was the day of the start and um we were starting the leg without any experience like big experienced sailors on the boat we had people who had done the race before but you know the most important guys in our boat had left so it was quite uh I was very much in doubt with with, uh, you know, risking your life and, and I don't know, for me, it was a hard moment. And when the young, all the young t uh, people step on the boat, I got some good advice from Tamara and from Nieti, from Mafri. And they just said, just, just try, just do the slag and see how it goes. And I think it was very good, the advice. You know, I think I, I did that for quite half of the race. And then I just, <laughs> just the next slag, just, just the next one. And then I, when I was halfway through, I was like, well, I already did half of it. <laughs> Let's just keep them going. Because I, I remember that start and I remember, like you say, it was, okay, Simeon is going to be skipper. No, he's not. Yes, he is. There's all this sort of changing. And I'm sure there's a whole um, backstory to what was going on that Simeon will be able to explain or, you know, will prefer not to um if i get the chance to talk to, talk yeah, to I just, him sometimes i just rather not to know you know yeah I, no completely we did we did what we could with what we had you know well you did great i mean that's the thing that that first leg and that was what i was going to ask is like you say okay i'll just do this leg and i'll see what happens when did you go okay i this is still good was because the boat was performing pretty well you, you know you guys were doing really well when you came out of the med did it feel good straight away or did it take you a while to feel like this is, this is still something I want to do? No, I think on, on these, on these big boats, you need to have all the maneuvers quite re, re, like a rehearsal. I'm not mm -hmm. sure the word in English, they have to be coordinated, you know, and everybody no, needs to know what they're doing. And I think on our boat, the, the crew was just so like, on the last minute that we didn't quite know how to deal with ourselves, you know, and the maneuvers were not, not sharp and leaving Alicante was so hard. You know, it felt so bad that afterwards everything was getting better and better. So we always had that feeling, oh, it's getting better. Oh, it's getting better. Until, uh, until we started doing up and back to, uh, to Lisbon, then we started losing a little bit, but, you know, that feeling of getting better was quite cool. I think we all got a little bit excited. And um, yeah, I think that those moments, you know, they they, uh, they make the race with the sailors because, you know, it's that common feeling. You don't need to, to speak with words, but you, you can feel it, you know, that everybody is on a proactive mode and enjoying it. Um, let me ask you a little bit about that then, that enjoyment and that feeling of, are we getting better? Um, we had some questions getting set, uh, sent to me when I announced that we were going to be talking together. One of them I thought was very good, very honest, which was when you get scared on the boat, and I'm sure you must get scared, um, do, how do you talk yourself back down into a position in your mind where you are in control and, and ready to race? How do you control your, you know, how do you control your fear? Um, I think it's two different things. Um, control your mind and dealing with fear. I think dealing with fear is dealing with the unknown and there's a lot of unknown in the race. But um, 
I think one very cool thing, it would be quite surprised. I never felt scared. You know, I felt small, you know. <laughs> Sometimes nature makes you feel very small. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I felt, I had a feeling all the time that the crew would do the best thing if there was a moment, you know, that happened, the crew would have done what needed to be done. And that's a feeling that you can't, you know, you can't pay for that. You know, it's, um, it's so incredible. You know, when we were in the Southern Ocean, just on those days where we had big loss, you know, for the whole race, um, I was thinking about that, you know, I was, it's, it's always on the edge, on the edge, on the edge. And I just had a feeling that if something happened, things needed to be done quick, you know, and there was no going to the water. You know, if you go to the water, I think you're, yeah, I don't want to say it, but you know, but you, you just, you can't fall. That's the thing. So you're acting on the boat. Like if you fall, that's like abyss, you know, you know, it's, it's grip on because I think, you know, doing a man overboard in, in, uh, you always practice it in very calm conditions. Of course, you don't want to risk anybody's life, but the reality is not the same. You know, when you're out there and there's, I don't think there's any chance of recovering a person in the Southern Ocean conditions. You know, it's really, really rough and you get, you move on, the boat moves so fast, you know, you get away from fixed points really fast. So I think the rule, <laughs> that we sat on is nobody falls <laughs> and that's it. Cause you had your, I mean, it's interesting to, to hear you say that you weren't scared because you obviously with T-Max and Abel had a very scary moment on leg three when you had that incredible jibe that took your mainsail track and broke, uh, ripped a whole bunch of the track off the mast your yeah but the boat was still there you know we were not sinking <laughs> we might have taken a long time to get to our destination <laughs> you know if we dropped the rig but um of course it's it's like conditions that you don't want to be in but it's not the end of the world i think it's not like dropping the keel when we finished the southern ocean just as we made the corner uh one of the flaps from that stayed below the keel that helped from the canting you know one yeah. of these uh, lips, they fell off and the water would surge up and, you know, really do a lot of pressure on the keel box. And the lid was like pumping like a heart, you know, and from my bunk, I could see that. And for me, that was, you know, that was always more concern because um, uh, if that had happened before, it would have been, it would have been really bad. But then we just had one more day and, Everything got a little bit calmer. We were getting close to the coast in Brazil and and uh, we were all sad again. But you know, we don't want you want don't want the boat to get injured. No, definitely not. Um so okay, so this then brings me on to another question that somebody wanted me to ask you. Um and it reminds me of uh, I remember seeing an interview with you when someone was asking you about the ocean race, and you said and I'm going to paraphrase, but you said that when you finish, you look back and you feel fantastic about it. And, you know, you you look back on, on, on how much you've learned and how much you've evolved. But when you're doing it, you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to quit tomorrow. I'm I'm done. You know, this is horrible. When you reach the dock and you've gone through some some well, what sound to me like very scary things about water coming into the boat, potentially. How do you motivate yourself for the next leg? Or does it just happen naturally? I don't know. Well, I think it happens naturally. I think you get so uh, involved with the preparation that you're just, you just want to go, you know? I think, well, that, that, that I can say for sure, coming from dinghy sailing, you know, you, uh, you do some boat work in your boat, but, you know, in the end, you just want to be on the water. And with these big boats, it's preparation, 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 preparation. You do so much preparation. And you just want to go to the water because it's, uh, it feels like you're spending more time on shore, preparation, you know, in the preparation than you're doing on the water. So it feels good to go to the water. And, and what would you if that prefer? answers your question. 
what, what would you prefer? But, uh, I don't know what makes people do it over and over again, you know. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It's something that happens, you know, because when you finish the race, you're like, oh, my God, what an achievement. But I for sure don't want to do another one. And then time goes by and, you know, you do other things and then you're like, ah, what if maybe, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, what would you, what would you do then in between legs to prepare yourself? And I mean, practically, you know, you step on board the boat, we see you all coming down on the parade and you're, you know, you're in your team kit, you step on board this boat and then you're going to go offshore for four weeks you have a little bag with you. I mean, what do you say, right, if I, I'm going to take these things, this is going to, you know, this is how I'm going to look after myself. Um, you mean, what do I take in my bag? Are you, are you a sweets? Are you a music? Are you a good book? Well, probably not a good book, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I think some of the legs were quite useful to having some distraction, you know, like I had some Brazilian music and, um some things like some notes that I did over the past years to read, something to entertain myself. But um uh you do really need to save up space because you uh you want to take as most the most uh, clothes that you can. But uh of course you don't wanna be a get a heavy pack, you know. So <laughs> it, you, in the cold legs you really need to take as much warm gear as you can. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, I felt a lot of cold and I felt like cold a lot of time. And my toes, I got um, frostbite and I only felt them quite a few months after the the Volvo. I think almost half a year after the Volvo, I started feeding them again. Wow. How how soon into the leg did your toes go numb? How quickly did it happen? I don't know. I got mocked a lot because I was busy on the boat and I think the second day I was already wearing all the cold kit that I had and everybody was like, ah, especially the Nordic, you know, the Dutch and the Danish, Nikolai. He was like, ah, just like a lovely summer day at home. And I was like, what? This can't be summer. Horrible. How how quickly into a leg like that and, and all of the legs really in the last edition started with big no, wind and big waves. Motion, how, how... Actually, to be honest, we had uh, good conditions until uh, I think the first uh, six days or something like that. And then we had a cold front coming by and then it got really cold and uh, really cold, really bumpy and really fast, you know, all the time on the tip of your toes. You know, and uh, when you got downstairs, it was really, um, you had to really be careful not to get injured inside. It was almost more dangerous inside than outside of the boat. And how quickly did all your clothes, all of them, become soaked, completely wet, and then that was it for forever? Um, I, I was always quite careful wearing, like putting my clothes on and off, not to try to get my socks wet. Mm. And... <laughs> But um, the boat is so damp, there's water dripping from the ceiling, you know, from humidity. And it's just like raining inside the boat. When you're sleeping, there's water falling on your face. It's uh, horrible, so humid. And the engine where we used to uh, put can the keel on the lighter legs, we use it a lot. But on the heavy wind legs, you barely use, you know, the keel because you're you get more, more or less stable wind the whole way. Not stable wind, but just strong winds, and mm. you barely use it. So uh, the times where you want to have your boot there drying, it's very small. So, you, yeah, it's just very damp and wet, yeah. What, what was harder, the freezing cold of the Southern Ocean or the hot, sticky humidity of the doldrums? Hmm. It's a hard question because for the um, some people, for sure, the hot and sticky was the worst. For me, it's just different. It was the cold was hard on your body, you know. It was just really hard, but you get quite tired of the heat. Like when it's ongoing for many days, it's just uh, a lot of people starting getting rashes and you know all kind of skin problems. So. <laughs> 
it's a bit disgusting and the cold it just hurts so much you go inside when your your fingers are defrosting you know when you're heating them up it just it also hurts so i don't know it's hard hard choice i think i i like the action more you know so the cold and the strong winds were you pleased with how you behaved um, when it got that cold, I'm thinking back to some of the small offshores that I've done. And I remember sitting on the side of the boat, looking down and seeing a rope that was in the water, but thinking, I am so cold. I'm a bit seasick. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to pretend that I haven't seen it. Were you able to just always be competitive and always working hard? Or were there times where the, the cold got the better of you? No, I think the cold makes you want to move, you know, so... Mm. On these occasions, you just you do want to move and want to get up that get that rope out of the water. The heat is for me it was harder because of the sun. So sometimes you know you didn't want to be in the sun, especially when you're um, if if it was really light and we needed a crew in the bow, it was really hard to go sit on the bow in the sun. You know, if you're trimming the sails, okay, but if you're sitting on the bow, it was just like ah, oh, unbearable. Let's talk, let's talk about helming um, the boats. And before I ask you to try and describe what helming a 65 is like, um, I think it's fairly, you know, it, it's a fair thing to say that it was unusual to see someone like yourself um, who was a first timer, but not only that, a female competitor in the race and famously the females have been overlooked for a long time, we've had many good female helms, but just the teams have not been picking them. When you joined Team Max and Abel, did you say, look, I want to drive? Not all the time, but I'm good at driving. This is what I do on the 49er, and I want to be on the wheel sometimes. Um, for me, it's a bit hard because I don't... I don't uh... It's, I felt like there's a lot of a bit of egos going on, and I'm not the person that says I'm a good driver. I want to drive, you know. <laughs> I will. Uh, I feel like I will drive if I if I deserve it. If I, if I like, if I'm good enough to drive, you know. And what happens is that before in the training, I didn't get any chance to try, and then halfway through the race, you know, Nico just hey just passed me the steering wheel, and it's like whoa you know <laughs> i haven't done that before but yeah let's go and it was great fun trying but i felt like yeah uh, you know you want to do that in the best way you can and i just felt like i didn't have the best conditions because i didn't have any preparation before but um i really like the opportunity but it, it just it's just you want the best for the team and you know, a lot of the young t other first timers did sail and helm. It's just, I think, with girls they have a little bit of uh, a step back, you know, because they don't trust us as much as they trust their buddies, you know. Mm. And it's it's a shame, but it's changing slowly. And I think we're part of this change. And I don't know. I'm not ashamed to say now that I for sure I want to help more and have I want to have this opportunity to show that. You know, I can helm well. It's just a matter of getting more time on the wheel. And I had a really good opportunity. I didn't have much time helming in the race, actually. But uh, I had an opportunity in the Southern Ocean that Nico made my race. I had, you know, a few minutes driving down those waves. And it's just crazy, you know. It's just a small, uh, so narrow, you know, uh, where you have to go and the room we had to go a little bit up and down and it just felt incredible just feeling the boat on your fingers on your feet on your face you know it's so many different feelings you can use to drive so yeah it was incredible a, a lot of people uh, um have come from high performance boats like the 49er and then they've gone on to helm the vo 65s the vo 70 i mean Ica martinez you know a lot of people seem to be going from the 49er. Is there a similarity in terms of the twitch, the, the, the style of driving that's required between the 49er and the 49er FX and the VO65? 
Yeah, the VO65 is a very fast boat, so the helm is very uh, light, um, and the boat responds very, quite a lot with the helm. And you you can, you know, it's a it's, when a, in a fast boat you can feel everything from the boat. If you trim a little bit, you feel the bow loading up. If you trim too much the main, you feel a little bit more the, the stern. It's very sensible boat, and I think. I don't know. The 49 is also very uh, sensible on the weight, but I think the the sails <laughs> make up for the weight on the 65. I don't know. It's in the way the way you the 49 you can't nose dive, so I think the way you helm and accelerate and stuff it's quite similar to the VO 65. It's just the light stuff that is very different. <laughs> yeah, and that's when you realize how heavy and sort of overly safe the sails are with this great big cloth going backwards and forwards in in the doldrums i mean yeah yeah it feels it feels a bit slow in the light winds and it, it does the boats from the last race they were uh, you know they felt really safe that was amazing but they are a little bit overbuilt when you're in the southern ocean you feel great you're like you don't want anything less than this you know but when you're uh, when you're sailing in like regular wind, you feel like you you want more uh, more uh, efficiency. I obviously I really want to respect the fact that you know you're trying to get your mind in the right place for the Tokyo Games. So I don't want to I'm not going to ask you too much about that, but just give us an update as to where you are with your preparation and and obviously with the delay to the Olympics. How is that? change does it feel good that you have an extra year or not i don't know it just feels like this year um didn't exist like it just <laughs> i don't know at least this half of the year you know we we have been maintaining our training quite regularly luckily we had a, an agreement with the club which was closed and we were using like it was our house you know <laughs> um so we kept on training a bit and just making it more fun a little bit to keep the motivation up and I, for us for us it's not going to change too many things um i think it's going to be a matter of who you know now when we come back who's going to be um um you know on top of the game and this this last month before the uh, rio games and for us it gives a little bit more time to prepare our uh, equipment that we had a lot of things to test and we're quite i think it's going to be quite good having more time well, finally, then let, let me ask you that I, I, I'm wondering about something. So there are a lot of good sailors in the world and there are there are only a few people that win. And those are the people that we remember. I mean, you yourself, I think you've got three second places at world championships. But that's not what people talk about. What people talk about when they talk to you is the gold medal at Rio the 2014 World Sailor of the Year. And of course, now you are part of uh, the fastest ocean race team over 24 hours with Team Axenabel getting their record. <laughs> Does having something like that, where you know that your name and your achievement is recorded in time, there it is. When people talk about the games, it will be your name that they talk about. Does that matter to you? Um, yeah, of course. I think uh, winning is good for any athlete's ego. But I think uh, how you perform is uh, more concerning. So if you were, you know, if you're performing really well, but you didn't get a gold medal, you know, for your silver at the Worlds, it's just you were performing well it's you, you want to perform your best you know and and be able to get a good result with that um it's very frustrating when you it's very frustrating when you start olympic campaigning and you only get like 20s 25s and that's the hardest part because you come from probably a you know a dinghy career or you know a somewhere where you were already on top of it and then you're back at the bottom so it's, it's a really hard you know, thing in the Olympics. But um, yeah, winning is always good for the EU. And and as you yourself, I think, alluded to when I spoke to you before, um, 
it's pretty good f- around the dinner table as well because your father was the fastest uh, back then, you know, the Volvo. He had the, the record, the 24-hour record. You've taken it from him. You have that record now with the rest of T-Max and Abel. Uh, his birthday was last week. I know what I would do in that situation. Do you find the time to remind him that you're faster than him now, according to the record books? No. <laughs> no? No, no, no. We, we just had a good time. We had a little sail in, um, in the, his cruising yacht, and we enjoy a lot cruising in family. And I, I, don't, I, I tease him only once, and that was it. He, he has a lot of my respect. You know, I can't. I uh, can't take that out of him. It's, um, it's, he's a really incredible leader, you know, in everything that he does, not only in sailing as, as well as with his social project and, you know, taking, um, he's a, how do you say, commodore of the club mm-hmm. and, you know, all these things that he does and he always does it with perfection and he's always thinking about everybody else and um, I think that's a great, you know, Great thing in a leader, yeah. All right, well, Martin, um, I know that you are in uh, in Europe now for a good reason to carry on your uh, quest for um, a good performance in Tokyo. So I will let you get back to it. Thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Well, my thanks to Martin Grail for a very honest interview and also taking the time out for her preparations for the Tokyo Olympics. Will she be able to repeat her performance in Rio? Well, she's working pretty hard to do so. Now, coming up, we have got Dee Kafari as a next guest on the Offwatch series, but we're recording that interview in just the next few days. So in the comments below, if you've got any specific questions for her, put them in there and I will put them to this offshore sailing star. In the meanwhile, you can enjoy any of the interviews that we've got in our back catalogue. And next week, we'll be back with more. See you then.